Now in Hawaii, we live in a place where we have a lot of energy in that, in that environment or that condition. And so I'm thinking, okay, when does it become a hazard? To me, it becomes a hazard when humans enter the picture and they can't deal with it, either because they don't have the capability or they don't understand what's going on there. They just lack uh, um, appreciation for that. And of course, we know that in some cases, the condition may be a hazard to someone, but no problem for somebody else. We have these great water people, men and women on the island that, you know, they live in the ocean, whereas some of us or the visitors go out there and they're totally intimidated by it and overcome by it. So it's a hazard to some people and not the others. So that's how I started thinking about uh, how, how this. So don't think of it just as a hazard. It's a situation or a condition that can be looked at and become a hazard at different times or in different places or uh, and so on. You know, the North Shore in the winter is tough. In the, in the summer, it's like a swimming pool out there. So we have to think about the condition to begin with and evaluate it in terms of whether is it a hazard now or will it be in the future. And you've got you've to put humans in there to make it that way because before humans got involved in this, none of this stuff was a hazard. It's just kind of the way it is sort of thing. So I'm going to talk about three things briefly. One is a little bit on the reef, but I'm going to come back later. This is, I put this together before I realized that I was going to be talking about reefs today as well. So I'll come back to that later. The second will deal with a little bit uh, of the beaches, specifically the condition of disappearing beaches, beach erosion and so on. Uh, just kind of allude to that a little bit. And then the third thing is I'm going to talk about conditions of the shoreline that have become hazards for people and relate to the history of drownings on the island. And then Pat and Monty are going to pick up after that. So. So here we are on, uh, again on this little rock in the middle of the largest ocean in the world. And most of us uh, do well on land, but not that well in the ocean kind of thing. So um, now one of, the, one of the first things we noticed, I didn't talk about this little light colored area around the island before. That's kind of a shelf. And that's directly related to a, a sea level change that, that occurs about every 100 to 120,000 years. And it has been occurring in a cyclic matter, or at least the last two million years on the planet. This is related to the heating and cooling of the planet, uh, even way before humans were even involved in the situation, just from celestial mechanics in terms of the relationship of the Earth to the sun, how much heat is coming in versus not. And there's a huge cycle that runs uh, at about 100 to 120,000 years where the Earth heats up and cools off. And those are our glacial, interglacial periods that we have good evidence for on many areas uh, of the continents and also uh, on the seashore. So about 100, I'm sorry, about 18,000 years ago at the peak of the last glacial period, sea level was about 400 feet lower than it is now. 400 feet lower 18,000 years ago. The edge of the island would have been out here at the edge of this little light colored area. You can see I, I put a few rivers that drained all the way out to the edge. All of our rivers drained all the way out to, across the land to the, to the shoreline and dumped into the ocean. As they did that, they cut deep river channels. And so then when sea level rose over the last 100,000 years, they flooded all that. And so we see, for example, all along the east side of the river, uh, excuse me, east side of the island, which is the wet side where all the rivers were, all our beaches are, are in uh, bays. They're indented river bays that are basically drowned river valleys. So that's why our shoreline is, the way, how irregular it is along that side of the island. So that's one thing um, that created that. The other thing is that uh, because it gets so deep so far going off, we have, um, well, here's, here's, the, here's uh, the cycle. We just look at back at about the last 140,000 years or so. Um, we see today we're right here at zero. Three or 4,000 years ago, sea level is about two to three meters higher than it is now. Then, then before that, back to 18,000 years ago, it was down here about 400 feet lower. So this is present sea level. 18,000 years ago, it was 400 feet below the present level. So everything that you see off, you know, just a mile ashore offshore in the ocean was all above sea level, all exposed. Then if you go back to about 120 or so thousand years, we, have, we were back, we were about where we are right now. Well, as the earth um, cooled down and started forming glaciers that took water out of the ocean, sea level, you know, in a very irregular way, dropped down to that level. And then it, everything heated up quickly and it boom, zoomed right back up. Again, and that's, it's a very asymmetric cycle, uh, but that's how it works. So it looks like since 125,000 years ago, sea level was within 100 feet of its present level only 27% of the time. Most of the time in the near recent geologic past, 
um, the you know, sea level was much lower than it is now. And if you take that all the way back to so almost 700,000 years ago, we see several cycles. This is the last one I just talked about. There was one before that, before that, before that, and so on. It's been going on for a long time. And there's good evidence for this all over the planet because of just dating glacial deposits, for example, and so on. We have pretty, this is pretty accurate information. If we, if we just go back to about 435,000 years ago and look at what percentage of the time sea level was in was within 100 feet of the present level, only 15% of the time. So most of the time, our island was, is much bigger than it is now. We're at a fairly high sea level stand at present um, that hasn't been this high for a very long time. So that's, that's kind of the history there for that. Now, this has a big impact on where our reefs are located. And uh, we see that our reefs are right at the shoreline. They're not barrier reefs that are somewhere offshore with a lagoon and so on. That's because everything gets deep pretty fast. So you look at the biggest reef on the island, uh, Anini, for example, it's like three quarters of a mile long and a quarter mile wide. It grows right from the beach outward. You can't get started offshore because it's too deep. So it has to build right from the shoreline outward. That's why you can walk right out onto most reef platforms right from the shoreline. You don't have to swim through a lagoon or so on. These are called uh, fringing reefs or, or uh, uh, coastal reefs like that, or reef platforms. Um, this is a KA beach, or, or beach and reef at a, kind of a low tide. So it's totally exposed above sea level. So everything growing on top of that reef is affected by the, the lowered sea level um, or the sea level change in that respect um, because of a low tide. So, which is of course the reason to find no corals growing on top of these reefs because they can't live out of water for more than a few seconds or they're dead. So even though that's a thriving reef, it's not because the coral made it that way. And that's, I'm gonna talk about that more later um, in the day. Now here's a view just from water level looking down on the Poly Coast. Great shot by the late David Boynton, great friend of mine. Um, and you can see it's totally exposed at that time. I wanted to emphasize the waves. Um, we're in the middle of this, the biggest ocean in the world. We have a lot of energy out in this ocean. We get everybody else's weather kind of secondhand by the waves that come in. So the big storms in the North Pacific in the winter send their waves to the south, even though it's a day like this. this. Uh, or in the summertime, uh, we have the big waves come from the winter storms in the South Pacific all the way north. So we have the big waves on the south side. And throughout most of the year, the trade winds blow in all the time on the east side. So it's kind of mess, you know, sloppy, messy water. You get out there like you see at Kealia when you drive by. It's just always kind of a mess. That's the wave systems. They're really different from one time of the year to the next. And you really got to understand those to understand what's, what's going on right at, right at our shoreline. So I made a plot in the typical year, 2006, where I have the wave heights uh, that were estimated for every day of the year. And I made these plots. So if you look at the North Shore, uh, this is starting out in, in the winter here and ending up in the winter. This is the summertime. And you can see in the summer, we're looking at average waves that are one or two feet at the most. In the winter, uh, you know, the average goes up to over 20, 25 feet. And then that repeats every winter. On the South Shore, it's just the opposite effect. The waves aren't as big because it has come from so far away. To, uh, the friction in the, within the water mass kind of dampens them out. But in the summertime is when we get the bigger swells, it might get up to five to 10 feet in some places, which is big enough to affect you. Uh, the east side is just throughout the year. There no, doesn't seem to be any pattern from winter, summer, because the trade winds are blowing all the time and creating those waves. Uh, the west shore is just a, kind of a lower uh, uh, pattern of the, of the north because it just wraps around the west side of the island. So, but if we look at uh, uh, several years for the winter, you can see how, how easy it is to time this. You can almost set your, your clock. By, you know, when you start getting into first of October, the end of summer, the waves just start coming up. And by the time you're in January, December through February, you get the really big ones. And then we get back down, but by, by around the end of April, we're back down into the summer again on the North Shore. And that's year after year after year. Um, there's, there's some variation in that. And occasionally we get, you know, a fairly high swell coming in either before or just after that time, but, but they're not very common. And we know when they're coming because there's good forecasting on that. In the, in the South Shore, the same kind of thing. It's a little more complex because the South Shore has a much larger ocean to draw from. So different parts and things going out there, you get storms in different places. 
that we will create swells that will travel for a very long distance. So it's pretty, pretty uh, uh, easy to, to figure that out you know, from year to year. <coughs> I'm going to say just a little bit about the beaches, which happens to be something I probably know more about than anything else I've talked about today, but I don't have really much time on that. But I've, I've recently kind of developed a, a new classification of beaches on the island. Um, and, and I've got three major categories. Number one, which has parts A, B, and C, are all the beaches around the north, east, and south side that are either in a little pocket, a little beach cell like a drowned river valley, or they're behind a reef. So that's how the reefs and all that kind of relate to that. Um, on the north shore, where we have the big waves, the reefs and the, the beaches are different than on the south shore where we have smaller waves. The grain size of the beach, the size of the beach, things like that are reflected by that, uh, as well as the east side. So you can, but almost all of these are, are carbonate. Now, what the hell is carbonate, right? <laughs> carbonate um, actually means lime. It's the whitish, you know, yellowish, whitish sand that occurs on most of our beaches around the island. And all that sand comes from breaking down the reef. Now, you might think, like, well, so what? For me, that was a big surprise because. I'm visiting a volcanic mountain made out of lava rock. Where are all the lava rock beaches? All that sediment is coming down the rivers and, and to the shoreline and not ending up on the beach. What happened to all that rock? I mean, this, this island is like 99.9999% lava rock and there's none of that on the beaches except for one little beach. Well, the reason is that the lava rock is very unstable chemically. And in the Earth's surface environment where it's in the atmosphere, which for rocks is a really bad place to be because you get chemistry and plants and so on destroying you. Um, it just disintegrates the silt and clay size. By the time it gets down the river to the shoreline, it's just silt and clay size and just floats away. Whereas the reef is made up of lime and that's much tougher. It stays around a lot longer in the Earth's surface environment. So that's what we have to make our beaches. And beaches don't care where the sand comes from as long as they have sand. So it can be anything. In this case, it happens to be lime. And so we won't find any quartz, for example, on any beach in Hawaii. Like that's the main mineral on almost all the beaches on the continents. But there are, there's, no, there's not enough silica in the lava rocks to make quartz, so we don't have that. The second major category over here are, are sandy. I include in the Poly Coast and in all the beaches of the Manak Coastal Plain, which makes up the longest beach in Hawaii, almost 16 miles of a continuous beach. That's all carbonate again. And it all comes from the Hyena area for the most part. That's the only major source of lime sand along this whole coastline, except for a little, couple little pocket beaches in here that knew Kai and Mililii and places like that. But mostly it's a, it's a freeway down there. The sand is just moving down that coast. Then it comes around this side and it meets currents going from the other direction. So it can't go anywhere. It just gets dumped on the sand. It's like a big convergence zone where everything's going from east to west across that way, and then it just ends up at the shoreline right there, or it goes offshore kind of thing. So that's why I put that into a longshore transport sand derived from the reef. And then there's this one funny little beach down here at Waimea, which is mostly volcanic sand. It's kind of a greenish gray color, and, it, and it's because there's so much water coming out of the canyon fed by Waialiali in the swamp that you know, it's, uh, it, it can bring a lot of sediment down. But Waimea Canyon is on the dry side of the island, so the, the chemical weathering is not as intense, so you actually get some lava rock sand that gets deposited there. So you've got you to mix chemistry and physics and, and processes going on here to kind of come up with this, uh, this kind of classification. So that's what all that means. So uh, and, and a lot of it has to do with what, what is the sand composed of. And I've gone out and counted in a little sample of maybe 400 grains and identified each one as to where they came from. And most of them, it turns out, are from a plant called coralline algae that I'll talk about later. It's not coral. Coral's not that abundant uh, on our reef or in our sand. Pardon? Coralline algae. It's a plant, not an animal. Coral's an animal. And uh, you know, for the east side beaches, it's like over 90% lime and then a little bit of uh, lava rock. And then on the west side, it's a little bit more lava rock material. And then Waimea Beach is over almost 90% lava rock and almost no lime. So big differences in composition that, that relate to how the sand got to where it is. <coughs> so here's an example of a pocket beach, Moloa'a, which is a, a river valley that once flowed all the way out here. And then as the sea level rose, it flooded it. 
and all the way back. And you see there's a, a line beach at the head of that and these rocky headlands out here because there's too much wave energy for the beach to continue. Here's a place along the east side of, uh, this is Larson's and then Kula'a Reefs. You can see that the reef here, it, behind it, it protects the shoreline and so the sand can stay there so the waves won't carry it offshore. So it's, it's a way, you know, that's why you have so many beaches along that side of the island that aren't in a river mouth itself. And then on the west side, it's the Google images shows uh, where all the sand comes from, moves right down the coast. Any of you who've gone down the uh, Nepali coast know which way the currents go. They go this way. They go, they go down the coast. You ever try to paddle against that, against the wind, the waves, the currents, you know it. And so it comes all the way around and brings that sand all the way down here to Polihali and actually all the way around to Kekaha. But that's the end of the road because the, the lime sand doesn't go any farther because it meets the currents coming from the other direction and the volcanic sand coming out of Waimea. So, you know, there's a convergence zone right there, but it's only about a quarter of a mile in length. We go from 100% volcanic sand to almost 100% carbonate sand in, in that zone, and, that, and that's it. So, and then finally, well, here's a picture of that, that big, long beach going around. And here's the transition zone right there, and there's the Waimea beach. Wow. And you can kind of see here sand coming out of the Waimea River down here. The only thing that messes it up is the harbor. It's like putting a dam in a river. You put a dam on a shoreline and you get a fat beach on one side and none on the other. And then, and then it comes to this point, Oomano Point. And most of that sand actually is diverted off by a rock headland and goes down a submarine canyon. It never, never gets around to Kekaha Beach. So it's, a, it's like a black and white issue for anybody on the west side. This sand is not black, it's greenish gray, but this is not white, it's yellowish orange. But you know, the, the idea that you can tell just by looking at the sand that this sand did not come from there and vice versa. So that's always been a controversy over there, especially when people start talking about they need to blow that harbor up so they can get their beach back over here. They need to figure out where the sand came from before they do something like that. So, <laughs> And there's the river mouth. There's the sand. I mean, it's obviously quite different. I shot that when they were still burning cane out there. Like that. And this is uh, just in a few years, the beach there has just disappeared. This, now it's the rock wall where the highway is. and. The chance for the beach coming back is minimal because for sand to get there, it's got to come all the way from Hyena, for one thing. That's the end of the road. And secondly, now we have a reflective wall there that any wave energy, energy coming in reflects back. And so the turbulence is so heavy in that surf zone that for sand to get dumped there is probably not likely. So I hope it comes back, but I'm not very optimistic about that. Uh, there used to be a beautiful beach down there, and everybody in the, in the community just loved that beach. It's a wonderful beach. Um, it's very sad that it's not there. So there's a couple options. One is to live with it the way it is, keep the road here, or take this rock wall out, take the road out, move it inland, and let the beach come on back in. And that's what would happen. But you've got a problem there with the cemeteries, you've got multi-million dollar homes, you've got schools. So, you know, humans put stuff in places where maybe they shouldn't have done that. But, you know, 100 years ago, nobody knew about this stuff at all. So. Well, we've done an interesting study on the west side um, that shows um, we've surveyed these beaches. We go out every month. We measure the beach, how wide, and the variation across it, and things like that. Uh, and we've, we noticed, for example, how dynamic these, this shoreline is. Uh, in Majors Bay up on, on the PMRF property, there's one beach there that within about a month, it, uh, it decreased by almost 300 feet wow. in width. It's about a 600-foot wide beach, and then it lost half of it in about two weeks when a big swell came in from the north. And where did the sand go? It went zip right around here, right, right by the drag strip shoreline. Not much change there, only a few feet. And, and at the beach at MacArthur increased by over 200 feet. So that was happy. The only problem is that when you start looking at these, uh, and I'll just, this is kind of, an, I'm trying to interpret this diagram for you. If you look at the north swells, in fact, from about October through, you see that right around mid-December is when things just started going crazy in there. And this is the width of the beach at Majors from 500, zero to 500. So within that period of time, it went from over 500 down to about 200. That's a 300 foot loss. But we've continued to do surveys and we know now, and we've got a latest one I don't have on this diagram, where it's come all the way back at Majors. But at the same time, the beach at MacArthur got fat and now it's gone back down. So we're looking at short term changes that are dramatic. And so far, we've just kind of done it on the west side. We're going to try to start picking that up and doing it on the rest of the island. So 
Okay, Whoa. this is a switch, a change. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the hazards. This is going to follow in with Monty and, uh, and Pat in a second. Uh, I've been doing, well, when I first started coming to Kauai and, and walked around the shoreline and started to get to know the shoreline and the zone of interaction, I also was reading the papers while I was here and noticing that a lot of people drown on our island. And so I started wondering, I wonder if there's a pattern to that. So I started collecting data that goes back to about 1970. I've read every issue of the Garden Island since 1909, so we had a lot of that data, and then police data and other kinds of data. And I started plotting the location of these drownings, and I noted whether they were summer or winter for the most part, and a lot of other things. But, for example, you notice all the yellow dots in here are, are thing, uh, drownings that occur within the winter, which is kind of an unusual distribution because we have, what, seven months of winter in Hawaii and only four months, five months of summer. Everybody goes like, yeah, but I thought it was always summer out here. <laughs> I, I'm talking about the ocean. We have two different climates in Hawaii. We have the land and the ocean. So uh, the ocean is in winter t mode about seven months. That's when the big north swells come in uh, from September through April. Well, if you look at that, you can see that it turns out that of the 148 drownings, and that was from uh, 1970 to 2012, um, 100 of those are in the winter and less than 50 were in the summer. So winter time. Yeah, so you go like, well, duh, that makes sense. The south side turns out to be pretty even throughout the year. And the east side is pretty even because we have pretty much steady waves coming out throughout the year. So there is a pattern to that from summer to winter, which is definitely related to the waves. But there are other things that are going on as well, and I'm going to talk about some of those. What are the different kinds of quote-unquote hazards that occur? I think of these, again, as conditions, but if you get into that condition and you can't deal with it, then it's a hazard. Well, I'm gonna, I want to show you some of the varieties. For example, at, at Ka, uh, there's a reef and a beach there. There's an entrance from the, the beach to the open ocean through a little channel, which is, I, I refer to these as uh, uh, reef channels. Some people might call it a rip, but I, I kind of have a different impression of what a rip is, but these are just permanent channels that the water always go out, goes out very fast. Why does it go out fast? Because you have all this water washing up over the reef platform, and it all drains out through that little narrow channel. There's a concept called the Venturi effect, where if you try to force a lot of water or liquid or gas through a, a constriction, it has to pick up velocity to get through that. So if all that water is confined to that channel, and you're in it, I don't care how many flippers you have on, you can't swim against it. You, you're going to be washed down the coast. So every single drowning has occurred here. There have been seven drownings there throughout the study period. And every single one was a person washed out of this and down the coast. And some of the bodies were recovered. That's K-A. All right, on down the coast, if you hike in on this trail a couple of miles, you come to this beautiful little valley called Hanakapiai. There's a very little, kind of little pocket beach right in there because the river drains out there and it made this little indentation. And in the, in the summertime, there's a beautiful little beach there. In the winter, there's no beach whatsoever. Um, and it, what happens here is people go in the water and there really isn't anything there but a long, very strong longshore current that comes down the coast. And the reason it does is because when the waves come straight in, that angle right there creates a current that will go down. It's pushing the water down the coast, basically, like that. So anytime you get a big angle between that and the waves coming in, you're going to have currents or that way or that way. So those are called longshore currents. And again, anybody who's kayaked or swam down in Nepali knows about that current. It's almost always there, even in you know, a little bit calmer times. So longshore currents. And here on the Kapiai, 30 drownings. Uh, everyone was a visitor, and 24 occurred in the winter. Two minutes. Okay, I got I got a cruise. I want to show. This is a Nini reef platform. Here are more permanent uh, channels um, that are always there. And in the winter, where most of, of the 11 drownings occurred. The waves come over the top and they drain out through those channels. So that's another reef channel situation. Hanalei, here's a place where the waves come straight in. They create currents that enter the middle of the bay and then they push back out. Was, that's a true rip current. Not rip tide, rip current. So there's, a, there's another type. Uh, nine drownings at that location. Uh, here's one, uh, kind of a bad area. Luma High, sometimes called Luma Dai Beach. There have been... Um, uh, 24 drowning deaths in this, during the study period, 17 winter, 20 visitors out of the 24. Only four people that drowned here were actually going for a swim. Most of them were either washed off this rock 
at this end, where a little trail goes down from there, or pulled out by the river mouth and drowned, or a few just washed off the beach and drowned in their aloha shirts. So uh, that the reason, there's no reef offshore. The North Shore waves come straight into the beach. There's nothing to slow them down. There's no shelf out there to slow them down. So true rips in that case. Um, Larson's, more reef channels. Every, every one of these 10, 11 drownings where a person pulled right out there, right out of that reef, that one channel. And Poipu, the Poipu area, which is very complex with lots of resorts and so on and little pocket beaches and so on in there. Uh, this ha turns out to be the single most dangerous place on the island to go for a swim. Poipu. Yeah. You probably haven't heard that. Yeah. There's a lot of resorts down there that don't like to point that out. <laughs> 40 drowning deaths. And the main cause, when today the main cause, in, in, in Cincinnati, we get one or two drownings there a year on the average. And it's because the little sandbar that was between this island and the shoreline called the Tombolo was taken out, all that sand taken offshore. So we get the east swells coming along and then they rip out right in front of the wild high. And uh, that's, that's a tough current to fight, especially when you just walked out of the back of your condo, probably hadn't been in the water since you were 12, and you don't know what's going on. There's no, really, there's not much information to help you with that. There is a sign there that was recently put up that shows uh, this rip kind of there. Um, but it doesn't, I don't, I mean, it's a great sign, but it doesn't really get people's attention because you go walk by, oh yeah, nice, nice sign on the beach. Um, but, you know, I, that's why I put 40 drownings on mine because I think you should get people's attention and thinking, wow, this is more dangerous than I thought. All right, the last one, Queen's Bath. Yeah. When you all hear about it being this horrible thing, well, Queen's Bath, you can walk down this little footpath down this ledge to the bath. There have been seven drownings deaths there. Only one was in the, the pond when they got washed out. Four people were washed off the rock platform there, and one guy snorkeled over from Hanalei and got in trouble offshore. So where's the most dangerous beach on the island? Queen's Bath or Poipu? Exactly, but you know, where, be, where do you hear that? And I'm just about done. Um, so there's a trend since 1970 here. Uh, it used to be about four, less than five drownings a year. Now it's well over 10. Uh, if you look at that, See this curve is a trend. There's, a, there's some dips in here that are very interesting. Uh, this dip and that dip relate to two hurricanes. With, when fewer people started coming to the island, this is visitors versus time. And today we had a few dips related to recession and things like that. They tend to kind of line up with the number of drownings. So the number of people that are here, of course, is a problem with that. So, and, and we get a, a lot of people visiting. They're mostly drowning from swimming, snorkeling. We don't get a lot of visitors uh, picking opihi or you know things like that. Um, three fourths are visitors, and I don't know, I, I don't understand this. Nine out of ten are males. The women would have more impressions about that. So we have plenty of plenty of people. In, you know, or you float more. Yeah, right. Just a couple minutes, Jean. I'm gonna just. We have a lot of people inviting us to the island, but we have. Uh, Plenty of amazing water people, some of the best lifeguards in the world here. But unfortunately, we don't have enough. If you look at just the, the, the 18 places where we've had more than five drownings, the ones in red, six are the ones we have lifeguard stations at. So of course, most people get to these places very easily. Most drownings are at unguarded beaches, although we have plenty from at the other places. And what do we have at these other beaches? We have these signs, the biggest word of which is warning. And that's not to give information. If you go to all the beaches with rain, drownings from 16 to 30 to 40 to 2, it's all the same sign. I don't think that's important. And, and this is one that always kind of gets me. I know Monty and Pat will probably argue with that. But I'd like to know how you create doubt in somebody's mind that comes from liberal Kansas and never been to the ocean before. And you got these little kids swimming around this beautiful, warm, attractive water. They don't know it's dangerous. There's no information to tell them that in that respect. But one of the really great things that's happened, I think, in the last few years are these rescue tu tubes. And I know Monty will probably say a lot more about that, but because he was one of the, he's one of the main people responsible for putting them up. And one of the best things they do is they give a lot of information. To me, that's informative, not just warning people about uh, what these problems are. So I think that's it.